This is Mark. Hey, Mark. Hi, Hi guys. Uh, okay. So let's get started with the interview. Okay. Do you have any questions for us before we start? Or... Nah. Let's just let's just do it. <laughs> okay. Let's start All off right. uh, with our first question. Could you just talk about yourself? Okay. Wait. Before we do that, you need to start recording. That's the main thing. <laughs> oh no, that's good. I'm I've got the auto recording on this side anyway, just in case yours implodes. So. Yeah, Murphy's law. Everything that could go wrong will go wrong. Yeah, yeah, and often does with computers. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna start the recording from my end. Okay. Okay. Okay, mine's on. Krishna, could you check yours? Ah, uh, it should be on. Yeah, mine's on. Okay. Okay, Mark, could you just talk about yourself? Sure. Like, what do you want to know? <laughs> um, like just a bit of backstory. So we little, okay, to... little little backstory. I started my career playing video games for a living back in the mid '90s. I was hired by a publisher out in Boulder, Colorado, and got to travel around uh, electronics conventions in the United States and and make games look better than they were, which was a lot of fun. And when they folded eventually, I jumped across town and ended up teaching proprietary software, most notably time and attendance software for the better part of 20 years. And traveled around the country and basically taught complex software to blue collar workers and administrators in the United States and outside of it. And that's what I did for a long time. And during that time, I, I never got married, never had kids. And I was just too busy, honestly, to be perfectly blunt. And that I was during that whole time was kind of into conspiracies and looked and, and had an opinion on just about every conspiracy you can think of. Some I liked, some I didn't like. And looked at Flat Earth just on a whim. Kind of like it's on my bucket list. I was over 40 at the time. And it's like, yeah, sure. It's, it's a piece of trash. Everybody hates Flat Earth. And so I should be able to shut this thing down in a weekend. And then nine months later, as I'm about ready to break my keyboard over my head, I realized I couldn't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. So I made a series of videos called the Flat Earth Clues as sort of a cry for help to put out to the internet hive mind because they miss nothing. And that was it. I put it out there and, and honestly thought that some academic would call me up and say, okay, here's where you went wrong. You forgot to carry the two. You can shut down your YouTube channel and go back to um, you know drinking wine and eating popcorn and watching movies. And they, it was the exact opposite happened. I had subject matter experts calling me up and people wanting to interview me. And, and uh, the next, you know, here we are four years later. And, and now I've done, like just this year alone, I've done three conferences, one in L.A., one in New Zealand, and one in Canada. And I still have six more to do. And most of those are outside of the country. So there you go. How weird is that? And you guys probably caught this, uh, what, the Netflix documentary? Uh yeah, we're we're halfway through it at the moment. You only made it through half of the documentary. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, that's fine. Uh, uh, but but yeah, that's and and yeah, the documentary was completely not our, our, anybody are doing. That was a mainstream um, LA production house that. And honestly, when we made that, I didn't think anything of it. It was like it's not going to go anywhere. And then it did twenty seven film festivals in eight countries. And then it's like, well, it's not going to be purchased and the next thing you know you know itunes and amazon and netflix and everybody bought it so i was like oh hey well that's that's good congrats on that yeah uh Christina, you want to ask the next question uh all right so mark so i was just wondering what the flat earth society is the original flat earth society yeah uh if if the world is software, then Flat Earth Society is, is um, 1.0, Flat Earth 1.0. And nobody in the community, none of the speakers, none of the people from the conferences, almost nobody that I even I, I know of uh, that makes content online is part of the actual Flat Earth Society. Yeah. They, were, they were just the remnants from, a, from different groups that have hung on forever. You know, the Flat Earth, Flat Earth there have been different Flat Earth Societies for a long, long, long time. Um, but we had nothing to do with them because when I got in, you know, when I when I first started looking into Flat Earth, I looked at the Flat Earth Society and 
I was amazed at how uh, apathetic they were. I mean, they had dedicated trolls that were just lighting up their channel on a regular basis, kind of like a, like a velvet rope type thing, where they were saying, they're not serious, go away. They're not serious, go away. And so we just decided to do our own thing, and, and social media and especially YouTube helped us. So we, we, we would consider ourselves Flat Earth 2.0. And the, the old society, honestly, uh, the first time I even heard from them was 18 months after the clues. And they called me up and said, oh, yeah, I like your work, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, hey, no offense, but where have you guys been? Uh, we've been running circles around everybody on social media. And that was the last I ever talked to them. So yeah. as far as we're concerned, there is no flatter society. We have nothing to do with it. And I mean, yeah, I have a membership with one of their old things. But that was just because I wanted to find out what they were about. So you're trying to tell us it's it's a community, pretty much. Oh, the, you mean ours? Yes, it is. Yeah. It is an online social media community. That's where we live. Um, most of it on YouTube, some on Facebook, some on you know some of the other things that that you kids do. But, uh, but we, for the most part, live on. Uh, if it wasn't for YouTube, we wouldn't even be speaking right now. Okay. Yeah. That's that's true. So. Uh, okay. Well, I have another question. Okay. We're just gonna. This sounds. Okay. Don't ask. Uh, what is your belief exactly? How, sure. why the Earth is flat, or me, and like how it works? Let's got let's it. That. So how I came to the conclusion, you know, why I made the series of videos was, uh, and I'll, I'll preface this with: Can I prove the flat Earth to you, one hundred percent right now in a court of law? No, I cannot. But I can create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn is some sort of model of a flat earth, some sort of enclosed world. And the physical model that most of us kind of agree, kind of agree on, because again, we're, we're still trying to work it out. We've only been doing this four years. Is that, again, you're not sitting on a, a little globe covered with water, covered with a little bit of air in this endless vacuum of space, traveling at five different velocities and five different directions, and that your life means nothing. You're living in a flat, enclosed world with walls and a floor and a ceiling, uh, a giant building, for, for lack of a term, uh, um, a terrarium, a planetarium. And you're all living inside it and everything else, everything in the sky is basically an illusion. It's, it's part no different than a planetarium. And if that's the case, if we were built, uh, it, you know, you have significance, you have importance, you were, you're here for a reason. Now, what that reason is, well, there's going to be a lot of speculation there, but it, it was built by one of only two things. Uh, if you're on the secular side, you're going to say it's some advanced technology, some older civilization that's much more powerful than ourselves, or you're going to go to the divine side. And I'm not necessarily saying it's, it's Santa Claus in a white bathrobe on a Sunday, <laughs> but you know, some people will, will see it like that. So that's what we think. Um, the, the little more detail on it, um, you're living in a building and inside that building is a giant saltwater lake. And inside that, on top of that lake, are islands that you can only describe as continents. The stars and the planets are just pretty lights in the sky. The sun and the moon are much brighter lights in the sky. Are they two-dimensional or three-dimensional? I don't know. Not, not exactly. But they move above us like a, a mobile over a child's crib. The sun generating uh, an incandescent light. The moon generating a cool laser light which is weird in itself and that's it it's and it seems to be bulletproof meaning uh we tried to bust out of it <clears throat> for a better part of four years from 58 to 62 the united states and the soviet union couldn't yeah. do it and so now they've just spent money and time and kept it a secret for as long as they can until they can figure out a a, a way to introduce it to the public that they can digest it and that's where I think we are now. I, I, the, and as far as the discovery goes, I think that the United States and the Soviet Union figured it out in around 1960. And uh, they're in a position now to actually release it if they wanted to, and, uh, which is why I think it's, it's being allowed to happen. But that's another story for another time. So, sorry, long-winded answer. It's fine. Uh, let's backtrack a bit. Yeah. Uh, you, you sort of described the earth as a a snow globe essentially mm -hmm. okay so how would you say like the gravity works because 
Where's oh, and that? I and, and no, that's good because a lot of the, the common misconception and some of that's from the flatter society is that we don't believe in gravity. Um, I, that's not the case with me at all. I absolutely believe in some sort of gravity, uh, mostly because mainstream science can't tell you what gravity is. Um, uh, you know, the, the most popular face of science, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, has gone on many times on television and says that science can't say what gravity is. It can only say what it does. It can only tell you the symptoms of gravity. Um, because it can't be replicated. Uh, and so for mainstream science, they say it's this magical molecular force that f pulls things down to the center of a ball. And for me, it's a magical molecular force that just pulls things straight down. Oh, but, but no, if, if you, if for anyone that says that, uh, that we, we think it's gravity because it's a disc flying through space at nine meters per second per second going straight up, nobody believes that. I'm not even, I'm not exactly sure where that rumor came from, uh, but it has, has, you know, spread a few, in a few different articles. That's for sure. Uh, uh, we saw the same thing, uh, when we did, did our research and it, they talked about how the earth was moving up 9.9. Yeah, 9. no, and no, nobody so believes that. The, the closest thing, by the way, there are some flat earth members, and I will say this, that believe in density instead of gravity. Which is interesting, yeah. because as you know, we're we're breathing in a, a thin version of water. You know, four parts nitrogen and one part oxygen. And if you you take a helium balloon, you let it go. Well, it rises because you know there is a density issue there. But can density account for everything? No. I think it's a combination of of density and gravity. I think there there has to be gravity in the end. But I also think it's enclosed, so that does a whole nother thing because then you're talking about a pressurized system. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, let's move on from this. So, could you have any specific evidence that you could show, like even a minor like detail that could show the Earth is flat? Sure. Sure. There's. There's. I'll. I'll give you the same five points that I gave uh, an astrophysics guy out in uh, Georgetown. There was a, a German, and if you've heard this, you can stop me. There was a German television team that wanted uh, to do a debate, and so they said, come up with five scientific points that you can throw at a physics guy in, in Georgetown. And I said, sure, why, why not? And, uh, and so I recorded these five points. Um, first one is long-distance photography. And that, that is the one that most flat earthers jump on right away because it's so easy to test, which is if the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared, uh, which is, you know, eight inches per mile per mile, then eventually an object is going to get far enough in the distance that it's going to be behind the curve. See what I did there, a little documentary reference, where it goes off, it's gone. It's on the, it's gone the other side of the hill. The boat cannot be brought back. And... The, uh, the, this, the, the quick point on this is that 10, 15 years ago, before HD camera technology was any good, yeah, you could zoom in on the horizon and you'd never see anything. But now, with cameras like the, the Nikon P1000, you know, it has such massive zoom that now you can bring boats back into frame that should be long gone. And you can see the holes if you if you want. It's not like they're and if they are disappearing hole first, most of the time it's because of atmospheric lensing. We didn't even come up with that term. We had to like learn all these new scientific factoids. Um, and the same thing with lighthouses and land masses. There are objects far off in the distance to where now I'm challenging science and I say, find me an object at 150 miles or less that you can never ever see because it's gone. It, you know, remember at 50 miles, just 50 miles. It's we're talking about 1,670 feet worth of curvature should not be there. And people say, oh, it's a mirage. They're like, no, nope, no, nope, because these mirages, they survive through time lapse and, sur you know, survive any light conditions and just about any reasonable distance conditions. Weather conditions can be targeted with beam radar and destroyed with military technology. And I've got subject subject matter experts will testify and have testified on air to this fact. That's just the long distance photography side. Um, second one would be the question of the atmosphere versus gravity. I'm sorry, the gravity versus uh, the vacuum of space, which is tell me where the bleeding edge of space is. So if you're sitting in a room right now, and let's say there's a second floor to that building, and that second floor above you is a vacuum chamber, and there's a cork in the ceiling. You pop that cork, you know exactly what's going to happen. 
that pressure is going to equalize instantly and violently and you'll probably black out and if that vacuum chamber above you is bigger than your room you're going to die so the question your blood's going to boil instantly it's a horrible horrible way to die the question is why didn't gravity keep the atmosphere in your room at the time and you say well you know it's too close blah 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 it's like no 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 no. imagine a globe sitting a tiny tiny globe sitting in your hand and your room is the vacuum chamber tell me how that globe with a very small amount of gravity competes against the the vacuum of space i've got industrial vacuum experts that say it's impossible cannot be done and even if you could say that it could tell me how the iss made out of aluminum and plastic can survive in the vacuum of space it should just detonate almost instantly um third one would be the eclipse shadow which doesn't make any damn sense uh the eclipse shadow uh the if you believe the mainstream moon thing the the moon is 2,000 miles wide and yet the blackout zone that goes across the united states every once in a while is only 70 miles wide that's a 97 percent decrease that means like when you're walking by a, a building your shadow would shrink down to the size of an action figure we never see that in real life and you say well no it's a condensing thing and you you can explain it with any sort of optics than you want I, and then i will flip it on you and i will say okay then the, the earth should do the same thing right so if the earth is four times the size of the moon the blackout zone should be four times as wide so it should be 280 miles wide or is it two four yeah 280 miles wide you should see that blackout zone on the moon it shouldn't be just a blood red moon we don't see it no one can explain it fourth one would be the um the cold moon which is and i didn't even think this was a thing i didn't learn this until i was at least a year into flat earth and somebody just brought it up to me which is we all know it's 90 degrees in the sunlight and 80 degrees in the shade give or take you know because whatever object is is blocking some of the sun rays well in the moonlight it's the exact opposite if the moon's high in the sky it's say it's 50 degrees in the moonlight it's actually 60 degrees in the moonshade in fact, up to 13 degrees swing. And that's impossible because at the very least it should be neutral. I mean, if the sun is reflecting the sun's light, you're not going to get a negative reaction to that. In fact, it's, it even gets weirder. Uh, if you take a magnifying glass to moonlight, it even gets colder than normal moonlight. Which, and I had to look this up, it's something that in universities uh, they've been doing for some years now. It's called a cold laser. You change the frequency on a laser, you can actually generate a cold light. Now, I'm not yeah. talking Mr. Freeze from Batman cold, but you, <laughs> but you can generate a cold light. And it's like, okay, and science doesn't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole because it should be impossible. And we've done all sorts of fun experiments with water and copper strips and digital thermometers, and it all works. And you can buy a $20 point-click thermometer and, and test it yourself. Uh, last but not least, my fifth point was, uh, as far as things I threw at science, is um, uh, the Van Allen radiation belt trap question, which is, if you guys know what the Van Allen belts are, uh, the question is, are they deadly? Yes or no? Simple question. You can ask anybody. In fact, I asked uh, Stanton, Friedman, Stanton Friedman before he died. And if you say yes, then they say, okay, how did the American space program do round trips through this Van Allen belt? multiple times i think six or seven times you know to the moon and back nobody died nobody got radiation poisoning nobody even got cancer there's still five of these guys walking around today how'd they do it with aluminum and plastic as shielding because the only things that can stop radiation are lead gold and a lot of water and you can't really use any three of uh, any of those on a spacecraft because it's too much of a weight problem especially water and if you say, okay, well, no, it's not that deadly. It's like, okay, then why, when I go to the NASA website, there's a wonderful video out there called on nasa.gov called Orion Trial by Fire, where they say that, yeah, with the Orion Project, we're not even going to test manned capsules because we haven't, figure out, we haven't figured out how to solve the Van Allen radiation problem yet. And this was made at the end of 2014. Uh, we, they, they can't really say that. They solved it perfectly back in the 60s with 60s technologies. So what, what happened? It's one of the reasons why you can't fake space anymore. They faked it as long as they could, and in 1972, they gave it up, and that's why nobody goes back. Nobody leaves. And those five points, they threw at the guy, and he folded like a card table and said, yeah, we're not doing this, and the Germans <laughs> went home, and the segment never ran. So there you go. Those are, the, those, those are my, my five big points. Now, some of them, do they prove a flat Earth? Nope, but again, what I said, they create so much reasonable doubt in the globe you got to go somewhere and you can't go to the globe, which is why we have a 99% retention rate. 
once you in a it's I'm not going to use the once you go flat you never go back that's just dumb <laughs> but but it's true once you once you're into the flat earth there's nothing to go back to it is the quintessential definition of the red pill blue pill from the matrix you know you yeah. when, once you're out can't go back even if you wanted to so there you go sorry oh. long winded answer but you wanted something oh it isn't it's perfect um <laughs> uh, uh, I have a side question to yeah. that. So, uh, so if you if we think about the Earth is flat, right? Yeah. So, wouldn't you be tech technically be able to see, let's say, if I look west? Uh, can't I see we, Japan from California, or can't <laughs> I see Mount Everest from everywhere? That yeah. question. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. No, no, it's good. No, it's, no, trust me. I've, I've, you gotta remember. All I do is I answer questions all day, every day for four years. <laughs> so, okay. So the big reason is what I mentioned earlier, and and I, I, I can't stress this enough, uh, is remember you, what we're breathing now, what we're talking through is just a thin version of water. Uh, if water is H two O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, we okay. are literally, and most people it surprises them. You know, we are living mostly in nitrogen. Uh, you know, four parts nitrogen, but just 20% oxygen. And I know there's trace gases. I don't want to get into that. It's just a yeah. small percentage. Who cares? We could, if you yeah. made it, if you made it 80, 20, we'd be fine. So, so you're trying to stay pretty much the water in the air ref refracts. Not, not refract, refracts. It just gets thick. Uh, think of it this oh. way when you're, a, and you can, you can look up footage it on this. Acts, when, it, when, when you go underwater, for example, on a really, really sunny day, scuba divers, you lose the sun entirely. I think at what, 200 feet? I mean, it's gone, and that's just 200 feet of water. Imagine 30 miles worth of atmosphere. Now, granted, the atmosphere isn't as thick as water, but it's thick enough to where, you know, at 10 miles, it might be 75% um, transparent, and then it goes to 70 and then 40. So, but to your point, if you pull down, and I firmly believe this, uh, because at, we, at high altitudes, when we're doing footage at like 30,000 feet and higher, it gets thin enough that you can see very, very, very far. So if you actually pulled the atmosphere off, I think you could see extremely long distances. I think it's part of the design of this place. Okay, that, thank, thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, all well, right, let's... Mark. Uh, so I have a question for you. So yeah. how do you explain the day and night cycles and also the seasons on a flat Earth? Okay. So day and night, not that hard. Actually, it's it's also part of the thickness of the atmosphere. And I know that the models, and I feel bad because in the in the models that we draw up of the flat earth, you have to make the sun and the moon visible on the models. But unfortunately, the sun and the moon, the real sun and the moon in our models is so tiny, it would almost be, it would just be a pin pinpoint of LED light because we're saying that the sun and moon are actually less than 50 miles wide. And if they were, then the sun's just going off in the distance is very small. You combine that with the thickness of the atmosphere and the light just gets less and less and it's gone. It's not going over the horizon, it's just going off into the distance. Uh, same thing with the moonlight. Um, when it comes to the seasons, and I know you guys aren't old enough to remember record players and vinyl, but, uh, or, or, you know, I'm sure, well, actually you guys know because rappers use records, yeah. I guess, every once in a while. But, uh, or turned, what do they call them, DJs? Yeah. Yeah. I'm old. So, um, the, I'm not that old, but I'm old. So, uh, like a needle on a record player, the, 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 the needle doesn't take the same path twice. So yeah. the sun is going to move closer to the inner disc and it's going to move out. Now, does that prove to be problematic for things like the Antarctic sun? If that wasn't a question on your sheet already? Yes, it does. The Arctic, the 24 hour Arctic sun. Perfect. Works great in our model. Antarctic sun does not because there's something else going on there. We don't know what it is. If it's a second light source or it's some sort of reflection or I don't know what's going on in Antarctica, but it doesn't really matter to us because we have an, a loophole there, which is Antarctica is locked down from civilians for basically all time, except for the occasional tourist. Yeah. Um, okay. So as a passenger on an aircraft, how yeah. is it that I can see the curvature of the Earth? Can you? Can you see the curvature of the Earth? If you oh, see well. the curvature of the Earth, I'll put out the same challenge to you as I did everybody else for the last four years. Because I've had people say they can see it from an airplane. I've had see people say they can see it from the top of the mountain. And I've had a bunch of people say they can actually see it from the beach. Yeah. I say this, all right, fine. Take a picture of it. Put it on your laptop or whatever screen. Hold a straight edge up to it. If you still see the curve, send it to me and I will quit Flat Earth tomorrow. <laughs> Nobody ever sends me anything. And it's kind of, uh, 
I don't want to use the term Orwellian, but it is kind of like that. It's not that you see the curve. You want to see the curve. Your mind absolutely, want, you know, the five lights, four lights, if you know anything about those stories, which is if you, you, you are conditioned to it so much that it's in your head, you absolutely want to see it because you're told since you were six years old, that globe's been in your classroom, that you live on this ball and it is curved. I talk to airline pilots all the time and they say, oh yeah, for front, front part of the cockpit, it's absolutely flat. That's all we see all day long. But the problem is, is we're told it's a curve. So there's this weird paradox. And then they say, well, why don't you tell anybody? It's like, well, honestly, by the time we take off and land and nobody dies, it's a good day. We're, we're just going to rinse and repeat and start over. And besides, even if they did tell everybody, and I have, I've had pilots. I had a 737 pilot out of Europe who was benched because she told the, the corporate doctors that she, does, she believes in a flat earth. And they said, you're not going up there again until you renounce that. And it's fascinating. So anyway, there you go. Okay, let's. Uh, okay, thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, let's get into some dicey territory now. Sure. Uh, so, is there any correlation between the flat Earth belief and religion? Yes. Or so it's, that's not dicey. You can you can ask that. It. Oh yeah, you bet. There's a correlation. Absolutely, is a correlation. At least half of the members. In the least, in the United States and Canada, I can't speak for other English-speaking countries, you know, like like Northern Europe and um, South Africa and places like that. But in the United States and Canada, at least half the members are strong Christians. Uh, that now the other main four religious houses have a stake in this: um, Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, and Islam. But Christianity definitely has the edge, and that is because. A lot of Christians have gone through the Bible with, uh, you know, with a fine tooth comb and going through chapter and verse. And there's only one verse that in there that even hints about the globe. Uh, and that's it's really, really interesting. And the other part of why religion is into this is because if it's if you're talking about a snow globe or a terrarium, well, the snow globe just I mean, it screams that it was built. Well, if it was built, it was created and if it created. Eh, there's your creator for you. So if you were already into uh, the concept of God, if even if you were agnostic, including me, uh, I mean, I was a tech guy. You know, I did tech support for years, and I didn't go to church for a long time. Now I still don't really go to church now, but I was pulled right back into spirituality because of that. If it was built, then it was built by somebody, and then you're kind of splitting hairs, really, because one man's advanced technology is another man's deity. Mm. interesting mm. i mean think about uh, it this way if a, if a giant golden spaceship landed tomorrow i mean you guys have watched sci-fi i'm sure of it if you're in yeah. physics um you remember you know, the prime directive thing when uh, I, I loved it. it most people glossed over it in the second star trek movie where they made sure that ancient culture didn't see them and the second they saw them go on that ship and take off they just threw out their old religion <laughs> it's like oh no we got a new religion it's star trek so I, I thought it was brilliant. And it's very, very true. If a golden spaceship landed in the middle of Paris tomorrow, uh, yeah, there'd be a lot of, of uh, sci-fi guys like you that'd be like, oh, they do look like Avatar. Or, but there'd be a lot of people that would just start up a new church tomorrow. Oh, that's, by the way, that's one of the other things. And that is whoever lands, if a spaceship, whoever does, if they have to land, they've got to be better looking than us. Otherwise, we'll just treat them like some sci-fi movie. Uh, District 9, pretty much. Oh, God, it can't be District 9. That's so weird that you mentioned that. I just watched that again yesterday. That is so... There's synchronicity for you. And it is still, to my, in my opinion, one of the most realistic sci-fi movies of all time because of, of how it was written. Meaning um, it, is, uh, it is exactly, you know, the, the attitudes, the discrimination, it is exactly what would happen if, like, a refugee alien race showed up. Oh, yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a ripoff of uh, an '80s movie called Alien Nation, but it's done so much better. Anyway, so there you go. Okay, uh, so as you okay, let's just talk about the uh, space now, pretty much. Sure. So you you said so, you, like other planets have been known to be round. Right. As, but why is the Earth only flat? It's good. Or is, no, that's good. Or is, that's good. Else. It's a common argument, which is if all the other planets, by the way, we don't say round uh, in the flat earth world. As, as you know, you guys being physics people, uh, round can also be two dimensional. So, yeah. you know, your dinner plate, dining room table, hubcap, yeah. if people still have hubcaps, whatever, rims. 
So, um, uh, we say ball, sphere, globe. So, it, are all the if all the planets are spherical, why is uh, why is the world why is this world flat? And then I come back and I say, who told you they were spherical? The same people that told you the Americans went to the moon, those guys. Because all you're really looking at them, seriously, from amateur telescopes, the only people that get any decent images are the United States military. Everybody down on the ground here, it's all fuzzy little lights there in the sky. But if you're wondering, okay, yeah, but they still look spherical. I go, yeah, yeah, they do. But that's part of the illusion. That's part of the trick. You know, inside a planetarium, everything looks spherical. I had an amateur astronomer come at me and said, look, I've seen the moons of Jupiter in my telescope. I go, fine, take a pair of binoculars, go to a planetarium. I know I'm older and you guys don't even know what a planetarium is. But yeah. you go to a planetarium and you look at Jupiter with the binoculars. And, you, and, and my question is, does it look more or less spherical? And it's like, well, it's not really, that's not really fair. You're in a building. And I go, yeah, that's my point. Who's to say when you walk out of that planetarium and you walk outside, you're just not in a much bigger one, which is what really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So you, you pretty much say that you're saying pretty much that other planets don't exist or are they just, they, like they exist, but only as, as lights. That's all they are. You're never going to be able to land on them. Similar to the moon. I mean, the moon is a bright, you know, pretty thing in the sky. Uh, but from our standpoint, you'd be lucky if you could land on it. It may not even be three-dimensional. Um, if you are in a building, think of this. There, there, and I've used movie references, and I don't know if you guys actually watched the clues that I, that I made. But, yeah. but, but there's, you know, the two movies that stuck out, of course, were The Truman Show and uh, The Village. But The Truman Show had the best quotes, and that is, we believe the world that is presented to us. And that is by the, the powers that be. If the United States military and the scientists tied to it, they're the ones that define space, well, it's fine, except, you know, you're putting a lot of faith in, in them and they could have ulterior motives. And in this case, I'm sure it's maybe a follow-up question is why why keep it a secret? Is that one of your questions? Uh, I was going to, before that, okay, I want to ask ahead. you another question. So you're also denying the moon landings of the night. Oh, God, don't even go. I could spend, I honestly, I could spend two hours on the moon landings, but I'll give you it real <laughs> quick. The Apollo, if you're outside of this country, I'd say, why would you believe the American military? In fact, why would you believe the Americans? We lie about everything. Um, but yeah, the Apollo, the Apollo program is really, really easy to break down. And that is, um, if you take a look at any still shot nowadays of the Apollo program with an astronaut and the lander and the car and maybe the dish in the background, there's so many things wrong with it. Uh, first off, the shadows intersecting shouldn't be if there's only one light source. Second, there's no blast crater at all. There should be a huge splay pattern considering they landed in what appears to be volcanic ash, even though they never dug down far enough to show you what was underneath it. I thought that was kind of strange. No feats of strength. If it's only one sixth earth, earth gravity, that means 180 pound man weighs 30 pounds. You, you should have a vertical jump that would be out of this freaking world. I'm not saying like the Martian Chronicles or anything like that, but still pretty good. Um, and then, of course, the, the satellite dish. You're talking about a VHF transmitter with battery technology from 1969. The active range, we looked it up, the active range of that transmitter is about 50 miles on a good day. And yet it punched with pinpoint precision through a quarter million miles through the Van Allen radiation belts and broadcasted 10 frames per second of full video and audio and received communication simultaneously in 1969? No, 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 ever. Oh, I'm sorry. One more thing. And that is the spacesuit. The spacesuit was impossible. Uh, and I made a clue on this, you know, called the um, uh, the lost nail, which says, look, the spacesuit defies the one of the laws of thermodynamics, which is pressure needs a container. The sp why isn't a spacesuit acting like a basketball, meaning it goes tight as a drum to where nothing can move? It, it and it was brilliant, and that was the reason why they did it was they figured that the most of the population doesn't know, and this is to you guys, doesn't know anything about physics, and they don't. They barely even know algebra. And so all they do is like, well, we'll just use a soft suit. I, who cares if it's supposed to look like a parade float and, you know, you shouldn't be able to bend your arms and legs at all. You shouldn't have any articulation points and your fingers definitely wouldn't be able to move well enough to hook up a satellite dish. And they did it. It's like, well, we'll just show it on television. People won't know. They won't know. And that was brilliant. So yeah, the Apollo program, absolutely a fabrication from beginning to end. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, let's, okay. Let's, I, I, I want to ask you. Is 
Do you believe in aliens, as I say? I believe that there's something flying up there with a technology that's more advanced than this. Yes. Do I think they're from Mars and Jupiter and Venus and Saturn? No, I do not. Uh, and I've said this many times, which is it changed my whole outlook. Now, I believed in them way before I got into Flat Earth. I mean, if you want to have some fun, uh, spend some money, buy a pair of five, uh, five X night vision binoculars and get your eyes adjusted and start looking up in the sky. I mean, the, the place is crawling with things and they're moving in every direction you can think of. They're not satellites. If they were satellites, you'd, you'd recognize the paths. They don't fly in squadrons. They don't make sharp left and right hand turns. They don't, don't, don't go ballistic. It was crazy. But are they from here? No, I think they're older versions of us. Uh, in addition to us being in a building, I don't think we're the first people to rent this apartment, not by a long shot. I think before, you remember our unbroken history only goes back 5,000 years. And yet we have evidence. I mean, forget about the ancient aliens television series. I mean, the sunken cities off Japan, the sunken cities off of India, the Bosnian pyramids, Bimini Road, the real pyramids. There's all sorts of evidence that points to civilizations, advanced ones that lived before us. Uh, and we're just, you know, the, the latest in a long line. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got another question. Yes. This might be just a lot of questions pretty much. That's fine, uh, that's fine. Um, so there's a private uh, company known as SpaceX. They, <laughs> they have been going to the, like, uh, going into space right. quite a lot. Yes. So it's not government government funded so what do you what, what's your opinion on that spacex all right i actually was writing about that in in my uh, my latest book uh, just a couple days ago spacex okay first off elon musk is a complete and total fraud it's, I, I i gotta get that out and if you think i'm kidding look up the new york post headline of that very title he is never anything everything he has ever said he was going to do he didn't that that's for starters right uh, uh, he was going to do a super plane that was going to go from the United States to China in two hours. going to cost as much as a business class ticket. He was going to make an underground bullet train from Los Angeles to San Francisco. No, he was going to save those kids with a super submarine. No, uh, the solar panels he was going to install in Puerto Rico after the hurricane. No, uh, what the hell? And I'm sorry, he was going to send two people around the moon and back in 2018. Well, that, that was last year, and he didn't do anything. The rocket was never built. The capsule was never built. There were no astronauts. It never, ever happened. So when all of a sudden I wake up one day and I see a red convertible supposedly flying around the Earth, I had a few opinions about this. Uh, one was, okay, physics guys, tell me how with the massive temperature swings of space with positive 200 and positive and negative 200 degrees, we all know what happens if you throw boiling water onto a windshield, why those side windshields just didn't get spider webbed right away? Why didn't the front windshield just get spider webbed right away? Why didn't the tires, remember this was just a production car, supposedly this was out of his garage, they put it on top of a rocket and they supposedly sent it into space. Um, why didn't the tires explode? Why didn't they just detonate, right? The tires, tires can't survive in space. At the very least, they would have turned into a freaking snare drum and burst at the very least. Um, and then all the other pressurized systems. Remember, it's, there's no oil because it's an electric car. So we're talking about the transmission fluid and the brake fluid and the window washer fluid and all the battery fluid. All those systems would have ruptured instantly. Never, ever happened. I'm sorry. There's a couple other things that bug me about that car. The stuff that because they were trying to fake space on the cheap. And what you saw was a couple things, and I, I didn't catch this. Somebody else pointed it out to me, which was why weren't there any endorsements on that car? It's a public company and a private company, SpaceX and Tesla. There wasn't a single logo to be found anywhere on that car. That thing should have looked like NASCAR. It should have been wall-to-wall -wall endorsements. In fact, why did you use the convertible? That wasn't even your state-of-the-art. Why not use your flagship S model, the four-door sedan? First of all, it would have been easier to do with the mannequin, and you had four seats to play with. You could have rented all four seats out to Disney, who owns everything now, and you would have had, let's see, instead of that dumb mannequin, you could have had Boba Fett, a Star Trooper, Iron Man, and Groot. <laughs> The thing would have paid for itself instantly. They did none of that. It was like, okay, we'll have this thing spinning for no reason, just spinning in circles around the Earth with perfect transmission capabilities. And then it's like, okay, it's off to Mars now. And they just cut the feed. What? No. 
Sorry, I have a few rants saved up and with yeah. me about SpaceX. The SpaceX yeah. is an absolute joke. And sorry, one last thing, and that is if they are direct competition to NASA, why were they launching from NASA and returning their booster rockets? And Fred, please, physics guys, tell me how you land two cylindrical rockets from speed from terminal velocity and, and use pulse detonation thrust engines at the last they had fuel for this and land them right next to each other bypassing any safety concerns you would ever do from an engineering standpoint oh the place was a, a production nightmare and they're, they're never gonna be able to do it again because there were too many people in social media that were saying hashtag not buying it hashtag what the hell and hashtag is this real so there you go <laughs> okay uh, Christian, right. you want to go with the next question? Yeah. yeah, so Mark, I have a question. So I'll be back in like a minute, okay? All right, so why doesn't gravity pull... Oh, wait, no, not this one. What? Um, so objects cannot exceed the speed of light, so doesn't this mean that the Earth cannot accelerate forever? We're we talking about the accelerate upwards? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. As I mentioned earlier, uh, nobody in the Flyers community thinks we're on a disc... Uh, flying upwards through space because most of the flyers community doesn't believe in space period i mean yeah. you if we're in a snow globe we could be sitting on that desk in front of you there, <laughs> there doesn't have to be space because whatever's outside it it's way more of efficient design even carl sagan said that which is uh for space it seems like an awful waste there's just yeah. huge tracks of nothingness so no no the earth's not accelerating through anything you're in a snow globe sitting perfectly stationary all right. So another question is, yes. how is there a magnetic field? Magnetics cannot be unipolar. Magnetics cannot be unipolar. You mean we have a ma in our model we have a magnetic north but not a magnetic south? Is that what you're getting yeah. at? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, no, that's good. Um, in, in fact, that actually works in pretty well because in yeah, in our model there's magnetic north only. In fact, technically there's not even a north, south, east, or west. They're just a center of the map, and then the outside. What's interesting is I have talked to several people, and there's YouTube videos that have nothing to do with flat Earth. It was something that came out just last month. They were interviewing a they were like kids' questions to people living in Antarctica, and they asked them, "What does the compass do?" He goes, he goes, the compass really doesn't do much of anything down here, which is what we suspected all along, which is at what point when you go south of the equator on a globe, does the South Pole magnetically take over? Meaning, you know, when does the South Pole dominate? And, it, and from the guys I'm talking to, including Australian military intelligence, they say it never dominates. It's always north. It, it's a cool little trick, which is it, it is always north, which works for the globe model. It's awesome which is when you're circumnavigating around a flat earth, you can make it look like a globe because magnetic north is always dominating. The compass acts exactly like it would on a globe. All right. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, do you have another question? Who, me? Uh, no, oh. Are you guys not in the well, same room? <laughs> uh, no, we are. We're, on, uh, we're in our houses right now. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Well, well, let me see if I have another question on my paper. By the way, what state are you in? Uh, we're in Canada. Oh, you're in Canada. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. We, we, we just had a conference up there in um, Alberta. Uh, we're in BC. Uh, well, I'm, I am not far from you. You probably knew that, though. Yeah. You're, are you in Vancouver? Uh, no, we're in Surrey. Oh, well, okay. yeah, Vancouver. But yep. yeah. I, I lived in uh, Victoria for a year. Uh, not not that down? long ago, actually. It was fun. It's a nice, nice place. Oh. Um. Well, you pretty much just answered all of my questions <laughs> that I had. You got. You got to remember. I get. I. I know most of the questions people people ask. There's only like between 20 and 30 different ones and so when i hear you going down a particular path it's like okay i'm just yeah. gonna go with it <laughs> so is there any any little things you want so you're gonna turn this into what uh, uh kind of a presentation on crazy flat uh, pretty much so yeah. it's just gonna be coming to a small snippet into our podcast and we'll be talking oh cool and just talking about is the earth flat or is it round and pretty much from all your answers we've got all our answers just got debunked so pretty much <laughs> well we well, have the answer of no no and earth trust flat. me when i say this i do not yeah. I, I appreciate that you guys are coming from a physics standpoint yeah um uh but 
and I don't hate science. And in fact, most people in, in flat earth don't hate science. And let, let me kind of wrap it up with this. We, the difference is, is that science tends to, or at least in the United States has tended to take, take liberties. They, they went from science to scientism, which is, again, if you tell, want, you want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level, fine. That's something I can, I can test right now. But if you want to tell me what the core of the earth looks like, yeah, that's a whole nother thing. Because remember the deepest hole ever drilled is only eight miles. And if it's 4,000 miles to the core, and all the artist conceptions, you know, show all these cutaways with all these perfect, you know, red and orange and yellow and white bands. How, how are you doing that? And then you're telling me what the cross sections are of Neptune and, G and Jupiter and all these other things. And that's just one of many things. I mean, not, not to harp on, on too much stuff, but I don't know, like carbon dating or evolution or the Big Bang or dark matter. That's one of my favorites lately. I mean, there's, there's guys with PhDs that are just spending their entire lives trying to, to, to see if dark matter is the answer. They don't even know if it's the answer for sure. They're just kind of going down this road. Well, we think it is because we, we need something to fill in this massive gap that's out there. So anyway, but no, I don't hate, I don't hate science at all. Uh, in fact, I have learned more little scientific factoids about science uh, than I have, I think, my entire university career. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I'll, all I want to know is the truth. I don't care. I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be famous. I just want the truth. <laughs> and yeah. wherever I find it, hey, great, fantastic. But anyway, guys, any anything else I can I can do for you? Um, well, I have another question. So, okay, how would you explain a lunar eclipse? Because the Earth passes between the Moon and the Sun, and the Sun projects the Earth's shadow onto the Moon in the night sky. Got it. So, how the, would you explain the, that? The blood moon. Yeah. Um, when you're in a planetarium, can we simulate a blood moon right now? Yes, we've been able to do that since uh, probably the late 70s. And that's just with limited technology, with a simple light show and a wooden structure, wooden and some metal. Uh, what you're looking up in the sky is just a, uh, a complex display system. No different. I mean, get a member. I, I know you guys are younger, but 20 years ago, we didn't even have HD. I, you yeah. know, this... And, and nowadays, what, what is it called? Poor people television, if you don't have it. I mean, if, um, and what are we up to? 8K? 8K monitors? I think that's the, the latest and greatest, 8K OLED. Imagine if you had like a million K monitor, what you could do. Um, there's, a, there's a company out there, you can look these up. It's fascinating. It's called Colux. And they can make skylights that simulate a sunny day in a blue sky. And it's absolutely undistinguishable from the real thing to where you can put that in a building on a sunny day and people walk underneath it they have no idea that it's that it's a sky that is a it's a it's a display system that is basically a high high end um, television that's all it is yeah. we can do that we've been able to do that for the last 4 or 5 years so imagine what we could do if we had another 100 years or you know a thousand not that I think we'd ever make it a thousand years but uh, imagine what we could do so blood moon it's easy I mean, it's super yeah. easy. Just uh, come on, you guys know software. You just turn the moon red. So yeah. it's not a lot of code. Uh, and I have another question. So <laughs> shadows. So shadows. pretty much, if I was to put two sticks down in two separate locations, right. maybe around the uh, country. Yep. And if the Earth was flat, wouldn't that mean that the shadow off that stick would still be the same length, but currently the length of both those sticks hap happens to be that one sticks uh shadows longer well, i got than you, I, got you. I, I know this one yeah the, the sticks and shadows argument yeah. which is yeah if you throw out nasa because you know nasa didn't invent the globe in 1972 yeah. you only have two arguments left one is the ship's going over the horizon and the other one is sticks and shadows uh the ship's going over the horizon just about everybody knows because the general public isn't exactly um super intelligent <laughs> and the sticks and shadows argument most people don't know but even mainstream science will come at you and say the sticks and shadows argument is also relative yes it does work if the sun is 400 uh, i'm not going to do it in kilometers for you guys sorry if it's 400,000 miles wide and 93 million miles away but it also works if it's really really small and really really close it's all relative so if that's the case what are you going to do i mean that you can do the same thing. I mean, literally, if you take a flashlight, you try with with uh, different flashlights in a in a dark room with two sticks on a or whatever pens or whatever vertical objects you have, and change the different flashlights and see what see what you come up with. It's uh, it's 
it was the only reason the sticks and shadow argument lasted so long is because there was no other other alternative sort of like let me throw out this at you real quick sort of like why people say well it's got to be gravity holding down the atmosphere because otherwise we'd be dead it's like well, what do you mean it's like well it's got to be gravity because if it wasn't we'd be dead it's like you're, you're making you're giving it too much you're saying that's the only plot line there and that is uh, well no the the atmosphere could also be here because it's in a pressurized system uh, not to use an environmental quote, but, you know, doesn't the term greenhouse gases make more sense if it's an actual greenhouse? Just a thought. Anyway, sorry. Anything else? Uh, Om, you got any questions? Are they gone? Sorry, I just got a call. <laughs> did, did you have your mute button on? Uh, yeah, no, I just got had a call. You were, so, you were taking a call during this important interview? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so offended. Parents parents <laughs> that's that's fine <laughs> uh, sorry about that i'm so sorry no 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 are you kidding no, no i'm i'm happy no ever since the documentary came out i was really happy because the director hated that uh younger people were contacting us and after that the, well you haven't got to that part in the, in the documentary there's a 12 year old who, who came up to you know the microphone when i was at a conference and that's when they really freaked out. And it's like, hey, great, because ever since the documentary came out on Netflix, I've had nothing but high schools call me for the last month. So there you go. Okay. Anything, uh, anything well, else? This is our final question. All right. To it all. Why do you think like the United States and the Soviet Union is trying to hide that the Earth is flat? Good question to end on. Okay. Uh, and that is the one out of every 10 questions that I get in email or phone calls. That's like, why keep it a secret? Why keep it a secret? And it's kind of a knee jerk reaction because you say, well, I, I, I tell, you know, initially you're going to say, well, I'd tell people I, I wouldn't keep it a secret. It's like, really? Wouldn't you? And I'd say, think about it this way. Think of, um, you know, uh, um, if you ever watch the X-Files, you know, the smoking man argument where you have a bunch of power people around a long table. If you want to call them the Illuminati, that's fine. I don't care. Um, but they say, okay, what could go wrong if you told people this? What if you release this? Because we're talking about power and the, and you don't want to, you know, men never, ever want to relinquish power. Um, it's three quick points. What, the first is academic and which is uh, you're talking about astrophysics and astronomy. They close their doors tomorrow and they do not reopen for a very, very long time. Uh, the remaining sciences, geology, hydrology, biology, archaeology, take your pick. You know, all the ologies, they have to rebuild from the ground up. And that's academically, and that's in every university in every country. We're talking about massive educational upheaval. Economically, uh, oh, I don't know, you'd have to suspend world trading for at least two months, at least, to figure out where the dust settles on this. And because, I mean, honestly, uh, world markets are so twitchy and they're so interconnected that anything could, could shut it down. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then last but not least, which is the, the religious angle. You're talking about giving those five uh, religious houses that I mentioned earlier, all, all of them at the same time, you're giving them leverage against, the, um, against science. And you're asking them not to seek revenge for science beating them over the head with textbooks for the last five centuries. That's a tall order. They are going to ask, and they're not going to stop with Flat Earth at that point. Then they're going to go, okay, you were wrong about this. We should revisit evolution. We could revisit carbon dating and the Big Bang Theory and, and Darwin and everything else that's ever been used against religion. You're asking, you know, you're, you're talking about basically a new, a, potentially a new holy war. Um, yeah, I wouldn't tell anybody either. I, I'm the first person to say that. If I figured this out in 1960 and I was in that meeting, I'd be like, yeah, we're not going to say anything until we can figure out how to release it to the public to where they don't start walking through the streets with pitchforks and torches and burning the place down. And so that's it. It, it was just a question of power. And it's like, okay, how do we hide this? How do we keep this a secret? Well, time and money. It's all you need. You lock down Antarctica, you militarize space. Uh, blueprint other space agencies never go back to the freaking moon and uh, that's it that's all you do and and keep this thing under wraps as, as long as possible uh, but I think that really really soon it's gonna come out just because I don't think that we're just the ones that have a vested interest in releasing it I think that they have the perfect chance now I mean think about it you've got high-speed internet social media and six billion smartphones you have the chance if you're the powers that be now you can spin any story you want 
and most of the public will be on board because it'll be on their phones. It's like, well, it's got to be true. It came across my cell phone. Uh, why wouldn't they? So there you go. Mm. Thank you so much for the interview. Oh, and yeah. if you have any questions for us, uh, no, 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 no. I, I, you guys, you guys had some great questions, and, and thank you very much for that. And considering you're you're from a physics <laughs> section, uh, I would have thought you would have been more insulting. But it was it was nice to to talk to you, and and glad that you were at least open minded enough to to you know listen to my stuff without wincing or saying, oh my god, the man is a nut job. So, anyway, no, thank you guys a lot, We're and, and be, so it's pretty much <laughs> be, best of luck with your project. And uh, if you need anything else in the meantime, if you have any follow up stuff or you want to talk to anybody else in particular, uh, feel free to let me know because I'm pretty much wired into everybody. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last, but uh, last but not least, yeah. Could we just get the recording if, if it's possible? Oh, yeah, yeah. As soon as I hang up, what will happen is it will compile on my side. and Because I, I already see the, the record buttons on your side. It should work. Skype is actually, that was the one good thing they did when Microsoft bought them. So I will drop it in the uh, the chat box as soon as I'm done. Okay. Right. Thank you right, so much, Mark. Mark. All right. Have a good day. And thank you for everything you have done. Oh, no worries at all, guys. You have a great rest of your night, okay? All right, you too. Okay, see you. Thank you. Bye-bye.